Ah, asthma, steel, saliva. What do these things have in common? Well, nothing actually, but James Sneed thinks so. But then he's the mathematician. James, how are you, mate? <laughs> All right, thanks, John. Now, look, I've just been trying to read your book, well, at least looking That's at brave, it. That's brave, isn't and it? And it's very brave, <laughs> and I do know there are words, and I'm familiar with them. But before we get into this, yeah. how did you get into maths? Why were you interested in the first place? Well, you know, the funny thing is, I suppose, that I wasn't actually inter interested in math for a long time. Right. I, I was always going to be a doctor. You know, my mum was a doctor and my dad was. And when I was a kid, there was never anything you could do except be a doctor. Ev everybody was. It was the only possible job. So I was going to go to med school. I applied for med school and la da 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 Did all that kind of stuff. And then just before I was going to go to med school, literally the week before, I thought to myself, do I really want to go to med school and start cutting up dead bodies and stuff? You know, anatomy and... Yeah. And the answer was absolutely clear. No, I did not want to go to med school. <laughs> so I went to the wherever, I, the dean of medicine or something, and I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go to med, med school. I'm going to do mathematics instead. Well, that's so. the very thing. So what you're saying is back then, there didn't seem to be any options, particularly in regard of even if you had been interested in maths, could, you know, could they tell you what you could do with maths as opposed to now? Yeah, yeah. So it was not nearly so clear. There were yeah. options were not so, not nearly so obvious as what they are today. You know, today mathematics is, it covers so many fields, including medicine and biology. And so if you go into math nowadays, yeah. you can feel confident that if you, if you're, you know, if uh, you turn out to be interested in medicine or biology after all, you can still do it. But back then it was not so clear. Yeah. So it was a, it was a difficult decision. Yeah. And, and was it sexy? Was it a sexy thing to do? Math? Uh, that cannot possibly be a serious question. <laughs> it's I, a come serious question. Is math ever sexy to anybody? <laughs> is it sexy now? Come on. <laughs> well, it's I think sexier, so. It's isn't it? It's a lot better than what it used, used to be. Because yeah. <laughs> you're a, a physiologist or a math... Uh, yeah, so... I can't even yeah. say the word. Physiologist. <laughs> what I am, I'm a mathematical physiologist, basically, which oh, means I study right. body parts. You okay. know, how your eyes work, how your ears work, how saliva gets secreted, how your lungs get asthma and you die, it's a bad thing, how your heart stops and you die, yep. how your muscles work. All those things, they require huge amounts of mathematics in order to, to uh, study them. It, not just math, you know, you need to have experimentalists as well. So there's some person in the lab or a whole group in the lab yep. doing a whole pile of experiments on asthma and you know smooth muscle cells in the lung of a mouse and they look at those smooth muscle cells and they contract down yep. and they can see the mouse getting asthma or whatever the mouse gets yep. I'm not actually quite sure what mice get yeah but, but they can work with a mathematician to yes. study it together so you ended up going into medicine anyway but through maths that's right I ended up essentially doing the same kind of stuff that I was originally going to be doing but I came to it from a completely different point of view you, you mentioned that thing about saliva. Does maths make you drool? Is there a correlation there? Well, there are many mathematicians who do drool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you can tell when they're level because they drool equally on both sides. <laughs> you're going to get a big fat new grant probably to make you Absolutely. drool a bit. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, uh, no. Have you, here's another question for you. Have you. Is there any project that is particularly spinning your wheels or something that you would like to do with your maths that you're not doing or a project that you are doing that you're very excited about? Wow. Yeah, so the project that I am doing that I'm really excited about is the asthma one that I was yep. talking to you about before. Yep. And the reason that is so cool is, yep. well, actually there are a number of reasons. Firstly, I mean, asthma itself is a really interesting thing. You know, yep. how does it work? Why, did, why do we get asthma? Nobody really understands this. And that's just an intrinsically an interesting thing from the scientific point of view yep. that you can study. Now, the fact that I like to study it using mathematics makes me different from an experimentalist, but nevertheless, we're studying the same scientific question. Yep. So that's one reason why it's really, really cool. Another reason why it's really, really cool is because it's, it's uh, very new in the sense that my, uh, my experimental colleagues just got these, this uh, new experimental method, which he's just worked out how to do, and he rang me up, actually, about a year ago or so and said, hey, James, I've got this really neat new experimental method. It's really, really cool. Do you want to do some math on it? I said, oh, oh, my, yeah, cool, Ab absolutely. So from that time on, you know, we started working together on this, and uh, it's just been an area where the math has really helped us understand what's going on when people get asthma, and I think we understand that quite a lot better now than what we did a year ago, and the math has really helped. So it's not 
the usual way you think about doing math. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's not an application that springs to mind because I mean we all because New Zealand actually gets quite a high percentage of it does, it does related complaints. Yeah, so we does. don't know whether it's pollen and we you know uh, certain types of exercise actually exacerbate it. And it's, it's a bizarre, that's, as you say, it's a bizarre exactly little right. en enigma disease. It, it is indeed, and it's yeah, we just do not understand it, and we'd like to. Yeah. So the fact that as a mathematician I can help is a uh, that gives me a buzz. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And what about the lifestyle of being a mathematician? I mean, is it is it a good life? I mean, what do you do on a normal day? You get up, have your coffee, you out with a calculator. Coffee. You have tea. tea. Come on, you have tea yeah. first thing. Well, absolutely. Actually, you're talking sponsored about that. by. Tea. Yeah, sponsored by. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> hmm. No, I, I get up in the morning, and actually, I have a fairly good routine because I get up hours before my wife does. Right. So she snores in bed happily for hours and hours and hours. And I get up and I have my cup of tea and then I have another cup of tea. <laughs> no, I have two cups of tea. Yeah. And then I usually sit down and write. And what I do in my writing is I write actually the second edition of that book, which is what ah, I'm working on now. Okay, we've got a, we've got a new book plug here. Okay, that, when's that coming up? Uh, maybe, I don't know, a year's time or so. Yep. So then I, in the morning I write for a few hours and then eventually I'll think, oh, I guess I ought to be going into work round about now. Yeah, it's half past 10, 11 o'clock. It's about time to go into work. Nice. <laughs> so I drive in through traffic, which isn't so bad. You not, see it half not past bad 10? traffic. And I teach a class or two and uh, do a TV interview. That happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've become the poster boy for maths right now. <laughs> well, you know, I, one of my party tricks is taking off my pants in front of the math, math class. And that has proven to be, surprisingly enough, a big hit. People are always asking me now to take my pants off. Well, that's a hell of an equation. How does that work exactly? Uh, yeah. Do you have a particular way of doing it that relates to Absolutely. a formula? Absolutely. So don't try this at home. Don't try this at home. But you can tie your ankles together with the length of rope, yeah. take off your pants, yeah. turn them inside out, yeah. and put them back on, yeah. all with your ankles tied together. <laughs> Sounds very Mr. Bean, really, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so um, asthma is one area that you're really passionate about, but you also do completely disparate things like steel and furnaces and there, yeah. stuff like that. Right, right. Yeah, so, well, that's the, actually one of the beauties of math is that it's so broad that it can cover a whole range of really interesting, cool things. And asthma is one, as we were saying, but I'm also working with New, Z New Zealand steel. Yep. And this is a problem completely dif different, but it's Again, it's a really cool, cool thing. So, New Zealand Steel's got this humongous furnace. It's a huge bloody thing, you know, it's this big, it's really long. And they take these enormous sheets of metal, sort of quite thin sheets, and they put them on these humongous rollers and they zoom them through this furnace and they heat them up to some temp temperature, okay? And then they stick them through a pot of boiling zinc or something. I'm not quite sure what they do, but <laughs> it, it does something to the met metal. Anyway, the point about this furnace is that every so often stuff breaks in it, you know, the heat, the heating element breaks. And they can't shut the whole thing down because it takes a week to shut down and a week to get back up again. Ah. They can't stop production. Yeah. But, you know, if one heating element inside the furnace breaks, do they turn up all the other elements a little bit hotter? Or do they only turn up some of them hotter? Or do they turn up half of them hotter and half of them colder? Or how do they compensate yep. inside the furnace if something breaks? Okay. That's a really hard question. And so they came to a mathematician, me, and they said, well, how can you use a mathematical model to try and help us predict, you know, which of these heat heating elements has got to be turned up hotter when its neighbour breaks and which is maybe going to go down cooler or maybe we should just move the metal through slower or maybe we should put a different kind of metal through that's a little bit thinner and we should start at 11 o'clock in the morning and then put the thin and then the thick and then the yeah. metal B etc. Well, yeah, What's the most efficient way to use this thing? Without a mathematician it would be exhausting. Uh, it's exhausting with a mathematician. Well, I'm exhausted. It's hard bloody work. Oh, I'm exhausted too. <laughs> <Just hearing laughs> <about it. laughs> so then you get to crunch all the numbers, play with all the possible 
Oh, well, not me the personally. Teachers. I get a student to do all the work. Oh, you know, okay, I'm but you take the credit. I take the credit. I sit and drink the tea, and the student does the work. That's so, the most important. So we have a student that's working with New Zealand Steel, actually spending a lot of time at the com company. Yep. At, uh, uh, spending time there looking at the furnace and getting uh, getting data and stuff about that and yeah. then coming back to the university talking to me and running through all our mathematical models to try and understand better what's going on inside this humongous furnace. Oh my god, furnaces. And you did, did, you, did you ever think in your wildest dreams you'd be involved even... Uh, Absolutely not. Yeah. Absolutely. Even a couple of years ago I would never have predicted it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, you see the random world Absolutely. of maths. <laughs> now I also understand that you're a yeah, some of the talent uh, for Limerick. Writing. Oh, dear Limericks, how embarrassing. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, I've read a few of them. They're pretty oh. racy. I'm just wondering, you know, is it, is it the, 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 the sacred geometry of, of rhythm or is it really just adolescent smut that you're interested in, really, when it comes to Limericks? Definitely it's the adolescent smut. Yeah. 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 Good. Definitely smut. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, the only good Limerick is obscene and offensive. And it's best if it's really offensive to someone you really don't like. Yes. But it's okay if it's offensive to someone you do you do like. That's fine too. That's okay. But as the offence part is the important. The offence and the obscenity is absolutely crucial. Yeah. Do, do you have any? You couldn't give us an example of a, yeah, a limerick? Of course I could, but I'd lose my job, wouldn't I? You know, I wouldn't want to do that. Well, could, so, we, we, maybe we have a nice limerick. We come with a nice limerick about no such, you. I thought I just said there's no such thing as a nice limerick. There is. I can think of one right now. Okay, where you go. Um, uh, James Sneed was a mathematician. In numbers, he put all his ambition. But then he caught sight of a lady one night whose figure caused a mighty revision. <laughs> you see, now that's a nice limerick, isn't it? Yeah, but it was not obscene enough. I'm oh, sorry, you're no. going to have to work on the obscene part. Yeah. Obviously, you see, the master. Yeah, we'll work absolutely. on it. Anyway, James, thanks for talking to <laughs> Pleasure me. Pleasure talking to you as well. Yeah, and good luck with the new book yeah, and everything thanks, else. Thanks very much.